Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to today's episode of M Patient Myeloma Radio, a show that connects patients with myeloma researchers. The goal of this series is to help you understand that your participation in clinical trials matters greatly. The doctors and researchers are setting the targets, but we are the ones who are helping them get there faster. I encourage you to sign up for our M Patient Minute newsletter where we post our upcoming show and past interview in a weekly email. You can do this on our homepage, www.mpatient.org. You can find links to our Twitter and Facebook pages on the homepage as well. So I am excited to have a conversation today with Dr. Shaji Kumar of the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. Welcome, Dr. Kumar. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, before we start, I'd like to give everyone a short introduction for you. Um, Dr. Kumar is a professor of medicine at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester and is a consultant in the Division of Hematology Internal Medicine at the Mayo Clinic. Dr. Kumar studied medicine in India at the top All India Institute of Medical Sciences. He performed his residency and fellowship at the Mayo Clinic and was a research associate at Dana-Farber. He's a Mayo Foundation scholar in multiple myeloma. He's a member of the AMA, ASH, ASCO, the American Association for Cancer Research and Society for Clinical Trials. He is an editor and board member for numerous journals, including Advances in Hematology, the American Journal of Hematology, Leukemia, and the European Journal of Clinical and Medical Oncology. He is the the principal investigator on a very large number of trials at the Mayo Clinic, and he helps to construct and coordinate many of their trials. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Jenny. Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining um, today. Um, What I would like to do is um, go over the landscape of what myeloma is today and the related diseases and the dramatic changes that have happened in terms of both treatment as well as um, uh, other supportive uh, care for this disease that have resulted in patients living a lot longer than what it used to be as short as 10 years ago. So when we talk about multiple myeloma, it is really the tip of the iceberg. We are really talking about a large group of diseases, what we call monoclonal gammopathies. The vast majority of the patients uh, who have a myeloma protein or a M protein or a monoclonal protein, I'm sure you all have heard that terminology, um, have what we call a monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance. Now, this is something that increases as patients get older. So if you were to take a 170-year-old people, about 6 out of the 100 uh, would have a monoclonal protein or a M protein in their bloodstream. Now, the vast majority of these patients will live a normal lifespan um, and may die of something totally unrelated, Um, but only about 20% of people diagnosed with this monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance uh, will get to a stage where the monoclonal protein or the increased numbers of plasma cells in their bone marrow would require any kind of therapy or intervention. Now, we don't know what causes people to get this uh, abnormality, but the culprit is the cell uh, that we call a plasma cell. Now, the plasma cells are um, cells of the immune system that we all have, which basically make proteins or immunoglobulins to try and fight infections and so forth. Now, for some reason which we don't fully understand, these cells become abnormal and they increase in numbers. And these, after a point, uh, they start uh, affecting the other cells in the bone marrow as well. These abnormal cells also create a lot of proteins, what we call as the monoclonal protein. And this protein by itself can also create problems by um, causing renal failure, for example, uh, by plugging up the kidney tubules. They also, um, the cells also can secrete a lot of chemicals which can result in the bones getting weaker. And that is why in patients with myeloma, we often depend on those four features uh, to make a diagnosis um, of active myeloma, namely the bone disease, kidney problems, the anemia that it can cause, as well as um, 
at the increased levels of calcium that can sometimes be seen in these patients. But as I said, the vast majority of the people have this monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance, which does not need any intervention, but do need very careful monitoring over time, because it's not always easy to predict who among these patients will go on to develop multiple myeloma. Now, a lot of research is, has been done and is currently ongoing trying to understand what actually um, is responsible for the conversion from this MUGUS relatively benign stage to a malignant multiple myeloma stage. We think it's a combination of things that happens within these plasma cells as well as things that happen around the plasma cells in the bone marrow in terms of increased blood vessels, in terms of decreased immune surveillance, um, and so forth. So um, we also have, over years, um, categorized a phase in this illness that we call a smoldering multiple myeloma which is kind of in the gray zone in between the muggers and the multiple myeloma. This phase where um, the, um, the, 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 basically the uh, myeloma cells or the past in numbers, um, but um, it, uh, it still has not um, gotten to a point where it's creating any kind of problem uh, to the um, to the body. So again, as with muggers, patients with small to multiple myeloma, we just carefully watch them over time to make sure none of those bad features we talked about is actually happening, which is usually the trigger for us to start treatment. Now, while this is something that we have to, you know, continuously year after year, we have to monitor the patients, um, but it also gives us the opportunity actually to maybe intervene early on to see if we can actually alter the course of the disease. So maybe can we actually intervene in somebody who has muggers and do something so that this patient will dev never develop myeloma? Or can we intervene in the smoldering phase to prevent it from becoming active multiple myeloma? So this is a very active area of research. And um, you, some of you may have read uh, reports about a recent clinical trial that came out where patients with smoldering multiple myeloma who were at the highest risk of getting active multiple myeloma were enrolled on a clinical trial, and half of them were treated with ravlomid and dexamethasone, um, and the other um, half of the patients were just observed, which is what we do currently. Now, the results of the trials were quite interesting in that the patients who got the ravlomid ahead of time lived much longer uh, than the people who did not. Now, the way the study was done, the way they identified these patients at the highest risk of developing myeloma is not something that we routinely use today. So mm -hmm. I think while it does provide some proof of concept that maybe an early intervention has some role in this disease, we still need to do more studies to identify who are the patients who, will, who are most likely to benefit uh, from this early intervention. So currently there are clinical trials that are ongoing. Uh, one best example in this country is the Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group trial that is available across the country where patients are actually being kind of randomized by, you know, flip of a coin, half would get Ravlomid and the other half would get uh, no treatment but just being observed um, as we do and, currently. And this is smoldering myeloma, right? This is smoldering myeloma, right. that's right. Uh -huh. And um, so this trial is going to be very important because this will give us, you know, Additional um, information, one, what we saw in the Spanish trial, is that is that proof of principle, is that thing still holds true. The second thing is we are using methods to identify patients with high risk, which is something which is using methods that we currently use in the clinic. So the results of this uh, clinical trial would be um, can be implemented in the daily practice. And there are other clinical trials ongoing as well, looking at other modalities uh, in patients with smoldering myeloma. To see, can we actually alter the uh, natural history of this disease? So I have a question uh, for you because now, now you're talking about smoldering myeloma, and I've heard other researchers talk about treating smoldering myeloma, but I've never heard them talk about treating potentially MGUS at an early stage. Right. So, so I think you know, this basically the fact that there is this whole spectrum of disease that happens before patients get myeloma presents with an opportunity which very few cancers have, uh, where we can intervene. The best example would be colon cancer. You find polyps, you take it out, and you prevent the cancer from happening. 
Mm-hmm. So can we replicate the same scenario in patients um, if it uh, monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance? The problem is, you, you know, when you talk about muggers, it's a very small proportion of patients who actually get uh, myeloma, and that's over a long period of time. So the chance of um, you will have to treat a lot of patients to or a lot of people with muggers to actually prevent one uh, myeloma from developing. So the risk-benefit ratio is different. So we really have to have some treatment that is very non-toxic uh, to be able to implement that in patients with um, muggers. So I think that's the critical difference between how we might intervene in muggers versus how we might intervene in small ring myeloma. So, well, that would, so yeah, that would be exciting. Of, that would be exciting to to know yeah, when no, you should use it and, and when you should not. <laughs> Exactly. No, I think yeah. you know um, the key thing is to understand what are the one what are the triggers that um, make a mugus go on to myeloma, and the second thing is when that change happens. We know it's a slow transition. Can we actually identify some markers on the plasma cells that will tell us no, this particular cell is already two thirds the way towards being a real cancer? So can we maybe intervene now? But the problem is when you look under the microscope, the cells in the bone marrow from a patient with muggers and the cells in the patient from with active myeloma, they don't look very different uh, in the way they look, um, unlike some of the other cancers. So that is one of the biggest dilemma that we have today as to identifying whom in whom should we intervene. But so I have, new, I have uh, a question for, about that. Could it Could it possibly be when a certain gene gets activated rather than a change... In the cell, right. So it, it, it def, definitely something changes in the cell, and we know that it's not the appearance of the cell. So it's something within the cell that changes, and we think it's basically you know the gen, the the chromosomes uh, or the genetic material in the cells undergo uh, damage, further damage over time, and they keep changing to the point where it kind of gets to the tipping point, and now the cell really takes off and behaves really like a cancerous cell. Hmm. So uh, the underlying, the underpinnings of this change is clearly genetic um, within the myeloma cell. But the question is how much of this is driven by what happens within the uh, myeloma cell versus what is happening in the cells around the myeloma cell. So it could, um, you know, it's not just the seed, it's also the soil that changes with time um, so that patients actually go from the muggers to myeloma. So before I kind of switch over to kind of um, what we um, w- what we are doing with patients with active myeloma, just want to ask, see if there are any questions specifically with this this aspect. With smoldering, well, I just think it's an interesting study to think about the environment and what's happening in that environment, and I've just been reading a little bit about that, about how how the environment inside of your bone marrow. A big difference as well, like you were saying. Yeah, no, I think it's a field that's very actively being pursued, not just in myeloma, but in all cancers. Um, mm-hmm. I think increasingly we realize that it's not just the cancer cell in isolation that is undergoing the changes, but it's also adapting the environment around it to facilitate its own growth. Um, so I think by understanding how that happens, we can potentially, you know, make the environment less conducive for the cells to grow. Um, and thus maybe slow down the whole cancer uh, process. Okay. So right. moving you. on to um, moving on to active myeloma. So you know, again, as I said, this is the tip of the iceberg. But obviously, these are the people who need the active intervention um, in an urgent fashion, so that we, things don't get any worse, and we can actually get things under control. So when patients have active myeloma, um, it, it typically means that these myeloma cells or the protein that's being made by the myeloma cells or other chemicals that are being secreted by the myeloma cells actually making the bonds weaker, the calcium levels can go up, the kidneys can shut down, and patients can become anemic. And there are other symptoms that can come along as well, but these are the four kind of cardinal features that we think about when we think about myeloma. Now, once patients have these features, then we obviously have to intervene. Now, clearly, you know, the treatment or the the approaches that we have taken for treatment of multiple myeloma has dramatically changed over the past 10, 15 years. And a lot of those changes, or primarily those changes, have been because of, um, one, the new drugs that have come along, 
to our understanding of the biology of the disease, we have a better sense of which patients will not do as well as the next patient. And we also have significantly improved our supportive care. We, are bet we can manage the infections better. We can manage the bone disease better because we have drugs like Aredia and uh, Zomeda. Uh, we can also um, have uh, provide better quality of life by m managing the pain better. Um, we can do procedures like kyphoplasty or vertebral plasty to uh, deal with the vertebral fractures, which can often be quite incapacitating in terms of pain. So there's overall around improvement in how we deal with patients with multiple myeloma. Um, as a starter, I think we, we will just kind of focus on the actual therapy, the different treatments that we have available. Yeah, sure. So, you know, so many of you, you know, uh, who have dealt with uh, myeloma themselves or have uh, um, loved ones who have the disease, you would have heard about the names of some of the drugs we use in the clinic. The new ones that have been approved for treating myeloma over the past 10, 12 years include uh, Velcade, which belongs to, or Bortezomib, which is, uh, belongs to a class of drugs called proteasome inhibitors. Then there's the thalidomide, ravlumid, or lenalidomide, and pomalidomide, or pomalist, which uh, all have been approved over the span of the um, last 10 years or so. And they all belong to a class of medications called immunomodulatory drugs. But we know that you know this immunomodulation or altering the immune system is just one of the mechanisms through which this drug acts. So there are multiple mechanisms, all of which we still don't understand fully well, but we all know very well that these drugs are very effective in treating patients with myeloma. Now, what we have, uh, the researchers in myeloma have done over the years is to try and see how best can we actually combine these new drugs, uh, either within the same group um, or, I mean, between the same group or in combination with the drugs that we had available for the past few decades, the old drugs, which, which would be uh, the cyclophosphamide, the melphalan, the doxorubicin and drugs like that. Um, so a series of trials, um, phase one, phase two trials, phase three trials, have looked at how best can we combine these drugs to come up with a regimen that is one, very effective, which acts pretty rapidly and has very little in terms of side effects. So there are several of those regimens that are currently being used. And I'm going to just take and three examples of probably the most commonly used drugs. So one of the things we use very commonly is um, the combination of lenalidomide or ravlumid and dexamethasone. Now, it's convenient, it's oral, uh, it's um, very well tolerated even in the older patients, and it's quite effective. And we know that, um, especially in patients uh, who don't have very, some of those high-risk features, which I'll come to in a second, the, this combination of just lenalidomide and dexamethasone does very well. Another combination is uh, one where we have combined cyclophosphamide with Velcade or Bortezomib and dexamethasone. And that is that combination of three drugs is also very effective, and we use that very often um, in patients who are going to go to stem cell transplant. We use, use that in patients who have high-risk multiple myeloma. And again, offers an option of um, uh, an effective regimen. But in contrast to ravlumid and dexamethasone, the velcade has to be given a, either intravenously or under the skin. Increasingly, we are using the velcade under the skin once a week, which ends up being a lot more convenient than how it used to be used in the past, which was intravenously twice a week. Mm -hmm. And over the years, we have found out that by using it once a week and using it subcutaneously, patients can tolerate this drug much better with very little neuropathy compared to when it's given intravenously and twice weekly. Now the third uh, combination that is used very often is one where both these drugs are combined together. So you have the Velcade, you have the Revlimid, and then you have the Dexamethasone. And that combination of three drugs is very effective. It can be used in patients with, who have poor risk um, features, multiple myeloma. And it, is, it produces very rapid response and seems to be fairly well tolerated. So those three probably are the most commonly used um, initial treatments um, that we use in this disease. Um, some of these patients might go on to transplant and some may not, and we'll come to the question of transplant in a second. Now, before I go there, I want to highlight one other change that has happened with this disease. That is this whole concept of how can we identify the patients who are unlikely to do as well as the others 
the patients whom we call high risk multiple myeloma and these patients constitute about um 15 to 25 percent of patients depending upon uh, how uh, we define these high risk features now why do we call them high risk the reason we call them high risk is because we know that um the the survival of patients with these high risk features tend to be considerably shorter compared to the pa- the rest of the patients so you're looking at about 20 20 to 25% of patients whose average survival is about 3 years compared to another 75% whose average survival is 8 plus years so there's clearly a um, a group of patients who don't do well and we really want to try and focus our attention on those patients because we think there's you know those patients clearly need some new treatments we need to approach them differently and we you know i think um, we have the maximum chance of showing a dramatic improvement in those patients by uh, focusing our attention on those patients with new treatments now how do we identify these high risk patients the most commonly used way is um is is examining the bone marrow cells and the genetic makeup of those cells by using a test called fish so using fish uh, we can uh look for certain particular markers or changes in the cells which will tell us that this particular patient has what we call a high risk abnormality another method which is quite sensitive um but it is not routinely used in the clinic is something called gene expression profiling now this is a more sophisticated test where they take these myeloma cells and look at the how much a particular gene is active and they can survey a huge number of genes and give us a kind of a pattern so to speak um so it's more of a pattern identification and we can looking at the pattern say okay this 15% of patients will not do as well as the remaining 85% so that's another test that is you know increasingly moving into the commercial space and maybe in a few years will be routinely available and that is a bone marrow through a bone marrow sample right correct Right. right. Mm-hmm. So the, both these things actually need those myeloma cells to come from the bone marrow so that we can do these tests on them. Now there are also other lab tests that we can use um to identify patients with high risk. Um and we can also do some tests on the peripheral blood uh, or the blood uh, sample that is taken from the vein that also sometimes can give us some clues as to who has this high risk uh, features. Now why do we bother to look for this risk factors? Two reasons. one you know if somebody has high risk features we really want to make sure the patient is aware of that because we might be looking at very different um you know different approaches and maybe different outcomes so i think it's very important for patients to be informed the second piece is i think we increasingly have started adapting our therapy based on what particular um abnormality or what high risk abnormality these patients have so for example if somebody has this high risk abnormality what we call a uh, loss of chromosome 17 or a part of the 17 chromosome is lost those patients uh, have um, often um, become resistant to treatment very fast and they um, uh, and so these patients are often approached differently so for example a particular study that was done in germany recently where patients got velcade based treatments in the beginning and then they got stem cell transplant and then they continued to get velcade based therapy after transplant that in that trial the patients with this particular high risk abnormality did the best that we have seen historically across multiple trials wow. so obviously by knowing that uh, that particular abnormality exists we can adapt our therapy uh, for that particular patient oh i think it's wonderful Yeah so I think we are get definitely getting closer to you know personalizing treatment or individualizing treatment for patients with myeloma there's no doubt there's a lot of work that needs to be done and um but these the studies looking into the genetic makeup of the cells gives us one very vital piece of information and that is myeloma is not one disease you know we call everything myeloma because they all behave somewhat similar the cells all look somewhat similar under the bone marrow but when you kind of break um down their genetic makeup we we probably dealing with a mix of five or six different diseases uh, which all look similar act somewhat similar but fundamentally are different uh, depending upon what kind of genetic changes have happened in those cells and maybe in a few years we will realize that these five or six different types or maybe more different types all have to have a different recipe for managing them but that's clearly where we are headed uh, with the with the advances that's happening in the in this disease 
And may I ask a question? What else needs to happen in order for that to happen now or in the next six months or a year? I think in the next six months or a year is probably um, it's going to be difficult because I think we really have to kind of peel off this layer by layer in trying to understand what are the changes. So we know it's going to be very complicated because when um, one of the very first studies that were done looking at uh, sequencing, basically look, you know, reading the entire genetic framework of the myeloma cell, what they found was there's a huge number of genetic changes that happens in these myeloma cells. Hmm. But only the most common type of changes that they saw were only seen in 3 or 4% of these patients. So clearly now we may have reached a stage where we have kind of dug way too deep in the sense that now we have a whole spectrum of changes, but we really want to identify a few changes that we can use to put these different myelomas into different blocks, which in turn can tell us what different type of treatments can be used for them. So I think that's, a, that's going to take a few years of work before that's going to happen. But the, in, the good thing is the field is moving in that direction. We are increasingly starting to design clinical trials where we are not going to take everybody with myeloma, but we're going to look for patients with a particular type of change, and we're going to use a drug that we think can directly target that particular change in the myeloma cell. So I think you know we have, that the real I think the most important step is the realization and the um, among the researchers that we are dealing with different diseases and we just cannot um, continue to rely on a one size fits all approach. Um, and and I think that is the key thing uh, going forward in improving the outcomes. Well, that that would um, it would be fantastic if that would happen. And I guess it would require some national or international studies if you narrowed it down to one type of patient, like just a deletion seventeen type of patient, and wanted to treat them. Maybe it adds some more complexity to clinical trials. I don't know. It certainly does. I mean, it's especially when you start looking at, you know, myeloma is not a that common a disease. I mean, we're talking mm-hmm. about 20,000 people a year in this country. Clearly, patients are living longer, so you have a large number of patients living with the disease. But still, when you start looking at smaller and smaller piece slices of the pie, we really need a lot of cooperation between different centers and, as you said, maybe even internationally to focus on these small and small, small groups of patients. But I think there's definitely a move effort to do that. Uh, there is a lot of collaboration between researchers, and I think you know it's it's going to happen. It's it's not a matter of whether it's going to happen; it's a matter of when it's going to happen, and I think it's going to be soon. So, um, okay. kind of moving back from that individualized approach, until we get there, we still need to have new drugs that we can use to treat patients with myeloma. Because the unfortunate truth is that the vast majority of the patients with myeloma eventually do have the myeloma come back. So we have to go back at it with something else that we are going to, so that we can keep the disease under control for long periods of time. So what are the new things that are on the horizon? The way I look at it, there's we can put them into kind of three different buckets. One, uh, the drugs which look very similar to what we have in the clinic now, but they have some added advantages. Either they can be taken by mouth instead of intravenously, or they have a better side effect profile compared to what we, their cousins currently being used. The second group are, they are drugs which are totally different class of drugs. They work very differently than any of the drugs we use currently. Um, and that, um, that, I think, is the most exciting part of everything that's going on because you know, we know that these myeloma cells eventually become resistant to what we can throw at them. So we need some new tool which will work in a different way. Finally, then, there's a whole um, spectrum of different combinations that we are looking at, you know, of the old and the new drugs to see if we can actually make combinations that will work better than the sum of the two pieces, the three pieces that go into the combination. So let's just take the look at the, the new drugs which are kind of the improved versions of what we have right now. A good example of that would be the drug called MLN9708 or Ixosomib. Now, it's an oral version of Velcade or Botosomib. It's probably the easiest way to explain it. Mm-hmm. This is a pill that you take once a week, um, and it's very well absorbed. And in the studies that we have done so far, looking at the drug alone or in combination with the uh, and dexamethasone, you know, again, 
difficult to compare different studies, but at least in the ballpark area, I think it's at least as active as the Velcade. But the advantage, obviously, is you take a pill a week instead of having to go in and get an injection once a week. And the right. second thing is this drug seems to have a lot less neuropathy than Velcade has. So we may have managed to, um, you know, kind of negate two of the biggest drawbacks that Velcade has by using this drug. But clearly it is in clinical trials right now, so we have to wait and see what happens uh, and what the results are before it will become available in the clinic. So there are two large trials ongoing. One is looking at the combination of MLN9708, Revlimid, Dexamethasone in um, patients with relapsed myeloma, and then there's a similar trial in patients with newly diagnosed myeloma. And we are also doing a couple of trials with this drug. Um, one is in combination with cyclophosphamide and dexamethasone, just like we did with Velcade in patients mm-hmm. with newly diagnosed myeloma. And then we're also looking at the drug in combination with dexamethasone in patients with relapsed disease. So these are the two trials that have not been done yet, uh, so we are in the process of actually enrolling patients for those trials. And so far, everything looks good. Now, the um, other kind of Me Too drug is the one which recently, um, the two ones that recently got approved. One is the carfilzomib. That is, it belongs to the same class of drugs as Velcade. And um, it, it has to be given intravenously. It has to be given two days a week for three weeks and a week off. But clearly, it's a very effective drug, and that's why it's got approved. And it can be combined with some of the drugs we have in the clinic today. And its combination with Revlimid and dexamethasone, as has been shown in a trial that was done at, um, uh, by uh, Dr. Chakoboviak, it's it is, again, a very active combination. So the question is, how do these two very effective three-drug combinations, um, uh, I mean, where do we place them with respect to each other? And we don't know the answer to that. So in order to answer that question, we are do, we have undertaken a large clinical trial, it's about 756 patients with newly diagnosed myeloma, that we are going to open up uh, nationwide through the cooperative groups, hopefully in the next two to three weeks. That will actually put half of the patients on the Velcade Revlimid dexamethasone and the other half of the patients on Carfilzomib Revlimid dexamethasone. What we want to see is, is one better than the other in terms of how effective the drug is, two, is one drug better than, or one combination better than the other in terms of how well patients can tolerate these medications. So we are very excited about having this trial open, and we hope that we can put patients on this trial very fast and can, you know, answer a very important question. And I guess the next generation from that would be, what about, you would then, after you get through your first phase one study of the MLN-708, then it would be used kind of in a similar way in combination to see which one is better out of the three, right? Correct. And the question there is, you know, again, may not be as much as efficacy as to whether the convenience and the quality of life aspects may be much better with one versus the other. So, you know, I think it's it's an exciting time. You have new drugs coming along. We are doing all these clinical trials. And I think it all benefits patients. And, you know, as we have seen, patients with myeloma are living longer each year um, and it's, it's a steady progress that we have seen over the past uh, you know, decade. Now, moving on to um, you know the drugs which are totally different class of drugs, I would say one of the most exciting drugs that's currently going through clinical trial are the antibodies. Um, so, you know, the, what we call monoclonal antibodies. So, these are antibodies directed against some protein that's present on the surface of these cancer cells. The best example of a success is uh, the drug called rituximab that has changed the face of lymphoma, for example. Now, we have for a long time um, have been yearning to get something similar to that in myeloma, and I think we are a lot closer to that. So there's this drug called elotuzumab that have already been shown to be quite uh, uh, active when you combine that with Revlimid and dexamethasone. And there's a large phase three trial that completed a, um, enrollment, and we are all eagerly waiting to see what the results would be. The second antibody is something that was presented at uh, the recent meeting, the ASCO meeting, which is uh, an anti-CD38 antibody. And this, again, targets a different protein on the surface of myeloma cells. And based on the very limited results we see so far, it seems to be something that we need to be watching out for. And hopefully we will have some some results from those trials within the next couple of years. Can I ask you a question about... 
sorry, can I ask you a question about CD thirty eight? How do you test for the presence of C D thirty eight? What what kind of test do you use for that? And is that so across all my cells universally present uh, have CD38 on their surface, and that's one of the ways we identify the myeloma cell. Mm. So the, the way we look at we can look at the, that by two ways. One is we can take the bone marrow biopsy and stain them, um, and look under the microscope. Or the more easy way to do it is to take the liquid portion of the bone marrow and subject it to what we call a flow cytometer, flow cytometry. Uh, so the, what this machine does is you first kind of tag these myeloma cells uh, with an antibody towards the CD38, and this antibody has kind of a color added to that antibody. And when it goes through the machine, it can tell which cells have that antibody stuck to it, which would be the ones which will have the CD38 present on the surface. And do all myeloma so, cells uh, have CD38? Just some? Yeah, almost all myeloma oh. cells have CD38, oh. and they tend to be fairly um, rich in their expression. And that's okay. why we think this antibody has quite a bit of promise in being quite selective in uh, targeting the myeloma cells. So the antibody is clearly a you know, very exciting area. But there are other drugs that are being uh, looked at too. Uh, so we have a clinical trial that's open looking at a drug called dinocyclib. Um, now that, you know, I won't go into the, the details or complicated details of the biology, but suffice to say that it is a drug that we have seen in the lab uh, being active against myeloma cells and most excitingly, this drug actually can make myeloma cells become more sensitive to Velcade. So we mm -hmm. first did a trial of the dinocyclic alone, and we saw that there's about 20% of these patients had their myeloma respond to treatment. So then we moved to the next phase where we are actually combining the dinocyclic with Velcade in one trial and combining the dinocyclic in, with carfilzomib in a second trial, both looking at patients with relapsed myeloma, trying to see if we can actually replicate what we saw in the lab. So that's, a, and, that's an exciting molecule. And I understand that that one's being used in melanoma also, right? That drug or no? Do I have that uh, wrong? The dinocyclic is being looked at uh, both in um, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, hmm. um, and that is the other main area that this drug is being uh, examined right now. Then there's also a, another drug that is, um, um, the data has been presented and looks interesting, is something called an array 520. And this is, again, is um, a, a drug that kind of prevents the cell or disrupts the mechanism by which the cell divides. So when the cell starts, the myeloma cell starts dividing, um, there are kind of strands that form in the cells which allow the chromosomes to be equally divided between the two daughter cells. And what this drug does is poison the cell to the extent that those strands don't form, so the chromosomes cannot separate in an equal fashion, and then the whole thing dies. Hmm. So this drug is also currently being uh, looked at, and you know, again, uh, about 20 to 30 percent of patients with myeloma, you can see a response to the treatment. So they are also moving on to the next phase where this drug is being combined with either Velcade or uh, Carfilzomib to see if that combination would work better than the single drug. So those are two exciting uh, drugs which are going through clinical trials. Now, there's a whole host of other, you know, um, drugs, um, and I won't go into all the details, but suffice to say that there's literally a couple dozen different drugs that are currently going through clinical trials at different centers across the country. Um, and, you know, I think the future is future holds a lot of promise for being able to identify new therapies for treating myeloma. Okay, just to back up for one second, I, I know bodies, um, sometimes those are called immunotherapies, correct? That is correct. So and I then, did not go into the immunotherapy part of it. Um, you know, I kind of stopped at the antibody therapy, but that is also a very exciting field, um, you know, with all those new um, technology being developed where you can modify your T cells um, and all those car cells that we've been hearing about. So manipulating the immune system is not a new concept. It's been going on for a long, long time, decades actually. But I think we are getting close to actually being successfully being able to do that. One of the best examples, for example, the, the vaccination, vaccine that was approved for treating prostate cancer. So that's one of the very first immunotherapy type medic approaches that have been approved. But now that we have reached, I think, the tipping point for that one, I think we're going to start seeing a lot of new immunotherapies that are going to come along as well. 
Okay, great. And then some of the the other category when you say new classes of drugs, just so patients know, because we see all things like HDAC inhibitors and CDK inhibitors and mTOR inhibitors, and they're very complicated. Right. And and it is. basically, and, uh, can you give us an idea of just basically what they do? They're they're affecting cell production, basically. So the majority of these drugs would uh, either interfere with the um, ability of cells to divide or they might actually directly kill the cells. So many of these drugs are what you call targeted agents because they don't just, they are not like an all cell poison like melphalan or cyclophosphamide. These tend to affect specific um, what we call signaling pathways uh, in the cells. So typically what happens in these myeloma cells or any cancer cell is that um, you know, they may have some some substance or chemical in the surrounding the cell that will bind to what we call a receptor on the cell's surface, and that receptor then sends some messages into the cell, which then goes into the nucleus of the cell and then makes these genes active and make different proteins. So what many of these drugs do is kind of interfere or block that signaling process. So it kind of chops off the communication lines between what happens outside the cell and what happens inside the cell, which then kind of you know, stuns the cell and then it cannot do and go any further or damages the cell to that extent that it just dies. Mm-hmm. So mTOR inhibitors, for example, inhibits a pathway, what we call a PA3 kinase AKT pathway. The CDK inhibitors inhibit what we call cyclin-dependent kinases, which are enzymes which are involved in helping the cell move through the cell cycle or the divide, division of the cell. And the HDAC inhibitor is something that you know interferes with the way the the genetic material uncoils or recoils, um, which then in in turn affects how well these genes can drive protein production. So okay. you know, as we understand more and more about the critical biological aspects of these tumor cells, we can figure out ways of targeting you know what we think are the most important components of this biological process. Great. Now, one thing I didn't talk about in much detail um, uh, has been the um, the role of stem cell transplantation in patients with myeloma. Now, the stem cell transplantation is something that's been um, around for a long time. It's very effective. Um, it certainly, you know, it's kind of giving a year's worth of treatment over you know a couple of days. Basically, patients are getting high doses of chemotherapy, uh, which we hope will destroy most of the bad cells in their bone marrow. And then what we do is take the stem cells or the stem cells that have been collected before giving the chemotherapy is then reinfused into those patients so that they can go into the bone marrow and start making new cells again. So the bone marrow transplantation has been, the autologous stem cell transplantation has been around for a while. It's very effective. It still plays a very important role in the management of patients with myeloma, in you know specifically patients who can undergo the stem cell transplant, the rigor of the stem cell transplant. So, um, you know, it's just like all the other drugs. It's a question of where do we use which approach uh, during the course of the disease. Mm -hmm. What we know is that you want to keep using, you know, it's like a building blocks um, that will, uh, building blocks for the bridge that's going to take us from an incurable disease to a curable disease. So if we can, you know, if we have a 65-year-old person whom we can keep using these drugs or approaches one after the other, and keep the person going until the person is 80 or 85, then you know you can say in essence, in essence that that for that person it has been a cure because at 85 the likelihood is that the person might die of something else which is unrelated to myeloma. Right. So you know depending upon what age you are talking about, the cure has a different connotation. Right. Okay. Is there anything you'd like to discuss, or should we? Uh, because we have some callers with questions. Yeah, we can certainly move on to it. I think the, 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 what I want to end end um, with is the, is a note of a positive note, and um, you know I think there's a lot of uh, changes that's happening. All good changes. Patients are living longer. We have more treatment options, and we certainly are able to control the myeloma for a lot longer than what we have been able to do um, for a long time. And I think that you know we are at a point where the discovery is accelerating. Um, um, over time, and we are going to see new treatments come on faster and faster. So, it's you know, it's a good time um, um, for um, you know it's a better time for patients with myeloma in terms of available treatment options. 
Oh, it's so true. It seems like there's so much going on in myeloma. So it will be interesting to see how these early studies are working out. So a question about clinical trials before I open up to questions. From a patient's perspective, if we participate in clinical trials, how much faster could we allow you to perform your work if a larger number of us were to participate? So, again, I'm, Jane, I'm really so happy that you brought up this question because, you know, the clinical trials form, it's the basically the, you know, critically important for us to continue to make these advances that we have done in the uh, past decade. To keep up the momentum, we have to be able to accrue patients to clinical trials. Unfortunately, what's happening is no, no more than 10% of patients with any cancer actually go, end up going on clinical trials. Now, there's a variety of different reasons. One, you know, sometimes clinical trials can be very laborious. It involves patients having to come back to the clinic more often than they otherwise would have to do. Um, and sometimes, um, you know, you, patients live far away from uh, referral centers um, which have clinical trials available. So I think, um, but still, I think this, the way we have to approach this is to, one, obviously we have to in increase patient awareness. We have to make sure every patient knows that there are clinical trial options out there. We have to do a better education of patients in terms of how to find trials, how to look through them, and how to how to help the healthcare professionals actually explain to them um, what is what is what they can go on and what they cannot. They can clearly go on to the websites like the clinicaltrials.gov and you know the, the myeloma foundation websites um, to find what trials are available for myeloma patients. They can always go to individual institution websites and find out lists of clinical trials available. And for most of the institutions, I would say almost all of them, you can actually call somebody and they would be able to walk you through or at least go through the list and see if anything that would be you know, would be an option for them. Mm -hmm. So I think overall we need better patient education, we need better healthcare provider education to, um, to make everyone realize how critical it is, this whole clinical trial um, system, for us to continue to make the progress that we have made so far. Yeah, well, I agree, and that's why we're doing this <laughs> series <laughs> is is just so we can help 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 describe it, I guess, in an easy and understandable way. So when you go to the doctor, you have a little bit of knowledge with you, and you can ask about their clinical trials. You can start being proactive about it. Absolutely. Okay, so we have um, several caller questions, and we will. If you have a question you'd like to ask, you can call into three four seven. 637-2631 and press 1 on your keypad. And we will take our first caller question from 2046956. Go ahead. Hi, thank you for taking my call. I have two questions. So I'll just ask them both back to back and if you wanted to take one or both, that would be great. Um, my first question is, for those patients who are in remission, are there any studies or clinical trials that aim to determine ways to increase the time in remission or maybe study those patients who manage to stay in remission for long periods of time? Maybe what are the, some of the things that they are doing in order to achieve that? My second question is, what is the role of donor transplant in treating multiple myeloma? Thank you. So the first question, in terms of trying to, you know, we have good drugs and good drug combinations which will help the majority, the vast majority of the patients to get into some form of remission. But we know that most, you know, almost all those patients, the myeloma will come back. So, it ha you know, a lot of clinical trials are being done to look at the question, can we maintain the people in that response for longer than what we currently are able to do? And these are some of the approaches, you know, the two kind of main approaches we we are doing right now one is called consolidation and one is called maintenance. And sometimes it's very hard to make out the difference between the two, and it's kind of a gray fuzzy zone in between. The essentially, all of them boil down to once you get to that remission, can we give some additional treatments, either uh, intense treatment for a short period of time or very light treatment over an extended period of time to try and keep pushing those cells down, keep a lid on those myeloma cells so that the myeloma does not come back for a long period of time. Now, the biggest problem is that Two scenarios. One, we could actually not treat and let the myeloma come back and use the drug at that time to treat the disease. Or we could keep somebody on that drug a long period of time, knowing that the myeloma is going to come back late, but when it does come back, 
we will be one drug less um, that we have available to treat the disease. So what we really want to prove is by intervening kind of early before the relapse happens and by keeping people on a lower dose a long period of time, we can actually not only just prevent the myeloma from coming back late, we can actually make people live longer. That means we want to change the fundamental, the biology of the disease by keeping at the treatment for a long period of time. So that's kind of where the clinical trials are looking at more of these maintenance approaches and the consolidation approaches. Whether any of them would be um, better than what we do right now is still remains controversial because, for example, in the tra post-transplant setting, there were two trials that were done looking at travelomate maintenance. One showed that people were living longer, and the one that was done in France has not shown any benefit in terms of people living longer. So it's kind of a, the jury is still out on that one. The second question regarding the uh, donor transplant or allogeneic stem cell transplant. Now, you know, th it's a modality that has been used in a variety of different hematological cancers, especially leukemia. The fundamental concept is different than autologous stem cell transplant, where we are essentially relying on a very high dose of chemotherapy to kill the cells, and the stem cells are given back just for the purpose of kind of repopulating or reseeding the bone marrow. In contrast, in the allogeneic stem cell transplant, what we are hoping to do is get some foreign cells into the system and allow them to live in that system, meaning the patient's body, and have these, four, these new cells recognize the tumor as a foreign cell and destroy the tumor cells, but at the same time don't, not wreak too much of a havoc to the, the, to the normal cells. So the allogeneic transplant, there have been a lot of trials being done again. Um, none of the trials have shown that the allogeneic transplant is any better than the autologous stem cell transplant. But I think the biggest problem has been we have really not asked the correct question, which is you know, realizing that the allogeneic transplant is a more dangerous procedure with more side effects. What we really need to do is to look at the patients in whom the current treatments don't work well at all, which is like the really high-risk patients, and see in those patients can we use the allogeneic stem cell transplant to make a difference. So I think some of those trials are ongoing at this point as well. So I think you know, it's certainly a valuable approach, but I would suggest that it always needs to be done in the context of a clinical trial um, as much as possible. Okay, great. Thank you so much for your question, and thank you so much for the excellent answers. Okay, we have um, another caller question at um, 949-552. Let's see. Okay, go ahead. Hmm. Oh, hi. Uh, Dr. Kumar, Jenny, am I on? Mm-hmm, you're on. Hello. All right, uh, great, greetings from New York. Um, greetings. Yeah, and thank you for um, the service that both of you are doing, Jenny, for the show and for your tireless effort and, and turning up great interviews, and, and Dr. Kumar for the great work you're doing. Uh, I have a question around for you, Dr. Kumar, is where do you see... Uh, what do you see on the horizon? Do you see any major disruptions on the horizon happening in myeloma? Um, is, is there anything that's, that you, you haven't discussed that, you know, I'm, not, I'm just saying go out there and be, you know, stretch a little bit. What's next? I think the, the next something, biggest something, revolution something that, is disease. Something that may not be mainstream. Right. So I think uh, the next uh, biggest revolution, I think, is going to be uh, the individualized medicine, understanding the genetic abnormalities and going after that with specific drugs. Um, it's really hard to know how much that's going to impact um, at this point because, you know, we're still kind of searching for those targets. But the, the key thing is that any, you know, any mutation or change that's been described in the cancer, uh, in the cancer cells, the whole machinery to try and develop a molecule to, act, to attack that target is kind of very well in place. So the key is identifying what are the changes that drive the myeloma cells. Once we know that, it's, it's a very easy thing to develop drugs that will target that. So it's, I think the search for the, you know, the Achilles heel is basically what's, um, what is going to be the most rewarding over the next few years, I think. Okay. Uh, so um, is that... Well, that's really where you think the next innovation is going to happen. Right. Um, 
who's working on stuff like that? So I think there's uh, researchers all around the country, and also you know, a lot of European researchers are also looking in that. I think what has made it possible is you know you can literally sequence the whole genome uh, in the myeloma cell, you know, for a lot lower than uh, what we could do before. So I think um, some of those studies, you know, once we have a huge number of patients um, studied in that manner, then we will be able to do a better analysis of these genetic changes to see how commonly they happen. And then we kind of go after what is the most common ones. And um, it's going to be an iterative uh, process. Um, we, you know, we might not strike gold all the time, but at least, you know, few of them are going to pan out, and it's just a matter of eventually identifying changes that would uh, account for all the myeloma. I, I was thinking of having my genome sequenced. I, I found that we could I could do it for about $2,000 right now, Correct. which is, uh, which is right. unbelievable. And they say yeah. that next year it's going to be 1000 and and about a few right. years down the road it will be $100. Exactly. It's almost going the going uh, getting cheaper at the rate at which all the computer processors are getting faster. I think it's actually a beating computer processing. It's actually going <laughs> down. It's going down faster than that. Have, do you know, have any of your patients sequenced their genome? And is, if I if I were to go out and sequence my genome right now, would that be? Is there anybody that would? Would they just look at me strange and cross-eyed, or is there anybody that could do anything with it? Um, so. I'm sure you will get a few strange looks. That's no doubt about it. Um, but uh, the question is whether we can actually do anything about it. Um, I think that is going to be the, you know, as I said, the next step. Because we might, you know, you may sequence a genome and we'll say that, we, okay, we have got 60 different mutations that we're going to find in that myeloma cell. Now, which one would we go after? That is something we won't, we won't be able to know for sure. But in case, let's say we had a, thousand people whose genomes uh, have been looked at and we find the same mutation happening in let's say 30 of them then we feel more confident going after that and that, so helps, I think so that, the, that would help that would help you so by myself it's not that big a deal but if maybe a thousand people did it it would generate some targets for the researchers to go after and we could just open source that data and make it available to the researchers maybe but then it, it comes back to you, right, um, in the sense that let's say if you are one of the 1,000 and you have 50 mutations and one of them we know happens in 50 out of the 1,000 people, then that's the one we're going to go after f for you as well. This, so this, brings you up an, this, yeah, this brings up an interesting question around, around privacy. Um, and as, you know, before I used to care about privacy, but, but now I don't, like, I think anybody who's got a disease doesn't really, depending on like if it's cancer, they, they don't care about privacy anymore. They're like, just cure me, darn it. So right. I wonder if, you know, if people would be willing to just open up their data and just say, here, here, cure me. I'm uh, Anyway, so thanks for taking the question. I don't want to hog the time, but I, I keep up the great work. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much for your question. Okay, we have one more caller question at 400-3656. Go ahead. Yes, doctor, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, my question is, what should patients ask about their tests to arm themselves with enough information to work towards targeted therapies? So, uh, sorry, I missed that. So what kind of information does the patient need yeah, to Yeah, what, what should I ask about my gather? tests so that I, I've got that information I need so that I can go and get, you know, get a more targeted therapy? Or maybe so think, even you know, push... Yeah. What what kind of targeted therapy you can get is kind of limited by what is out there in the clinical trials right now. You know, mm -hmm. For example, if you have a particular, um, let's say, genetic change identified in your cell, which we have seen in other types of cancers, and maybe there's a drug that's approved for that, you know, your physician may be able to try something which is off-label kind of a thing, but, you know, that is not the way we want to approach this. We want to do that in a systematic fashion so that, you know, we do the, all these things in the context of clinical trials. So I think um, the information, the basic information that I think will will help us today is like the fish testing, the cytogenetic testing that we can act upon today. Things mm -hmm. like the sequencing or the genome testing is something that the the amount the amount of information has to get to a tipping point before we can actually um, do anything about it. Um, but again, you know, it depends on clinical trials. 
um, it depends on the clinical trials at this point. But as a, as a lay patient, are there parts of that test that I should focus on um, so that I can be more informed myself as as you know as I'm reviewing these these uh, options with the doctors? No, I think the genomic information at this time is probably not prime time uh, for you to take to a physician and say, okay, I have these mutations. Can you, what can you do for me? I think that has to be mm-hmm. in the context of clinical trial. But okay. the other information, you know, uh, the the fish studies. You know, somebody with a newly diagnosed myeloma, I think it's important that they get a fish testing done on the bone marrow. So, mm-hmm. you know, that piece of information would be critical so that they can insist that happens. Okay. I really appreciate you taking your time with us today. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you for your call. Well, Dr. Kumar, um, we're going to close because our time is up, but thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Jenny, for doing this. Well, thank you for all that you're doing to move forward towards a cure for myeloma and better outcomes for all myeloma patients. We're just very, really very grateful. All the best to everyone who's been listening, and thank you. Bye. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for listening to another episode of Innovation in Myeloma. Join us next week for our next inpatient radio interview as we learn more about how we can help drive to cure for myeloma. Ryan here and I have a question for you. What do you do when you win? Like are you a fist pumper, a woohooer, a hand clapper, a high fiver? I kind of like the high five, but if you want to hone in on those winning moves, check out Chumba Casino. At chumbacasino.com, choose from hundreds of social casino-style games for your chance to redeem serious cash prizes. There are new game releases weekly plus free daily bonuses, so don't wait. Start having the most fun ever at chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. DGW report prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18+. Plus.